uh, we're so excited about getting the conversation going, so please join me in welcoming Mark Busby and Rick Bass. Thank you. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here, especially to be here with Rick, who is, uh, you know, has, what, 30 books now, something like that, uh, but who's counting? Uh, it, it, and uh, I was reminded of, uh, of a story. Uh, I was at a conference uh, a good many years ago, and somebody, there were two guys sitting at the table where I was sitting, and one of them said, well, you know, that's just great that, uh, you know, this writer who's known for writing about the natural world has, you know, a name, Rick Bass. It just corresponds to his interests. And the other guy said, oh, well, that's, uh, that's not really it. The family is musical. It was Rick Bass. <laughs> <laughs> well, a, a, a bad joke, bad joke. Uh, I wasn't sure, we weren't sure exactly how many people would be here who would know a lot about John Graves. Uh, and uh, some of my students who are here don't know much about John Graves, so I thought that I would uh, talk for a few minutes about uh, uh, who John Graves was and then uh, uh, ask Rick to respond to some, uh, uh, some ideas about uh, how he is going to approach this biography that he is writing about John Graves. And there are a lot of issues that uh, will probably uh, enter into that biography in some way. And so this will be a chance for him to sort of bounce these ideas off of those of us here. So for those of you who don't know anything, how many of you know very little about John Graves? So here are some things about John Graves. He was, he was born August 6th in, in Fort Worth, Texas. And what's interesting about that, he was born in 1920. And, uh, uh, He's, uh, he was married, he is of course dead now, he died uh, in uh, 2013, the end of July. Um, but I, I often thought, well this is, you know, this is interesting that we have two Texas writers of, of quite different generations, but both of them were born in Fort Worth, but both of them uh, had families, uh, had two daughters, and uh, uh, wrote about the, the natural world. And this is one of the questions that I have for Rick, is all these biographies say that he was born in Fort Worth, but somehow he got to Houston in a hurry. And uh, I'll ask him, and he can tell us just, you know, just how much he has a connection to Fort Worth other than having been, been birthed there. John Graves um, grew up in Fort Worth and spent a lot of time out on the Trinity River. And uh, even though he was, uh, you know, Fort Worth was a, was a small city then, that he had these ways that he got away from the, from the city. And he eventually got a BA at Rice in 1942, and you can just think about that for a minute and you'll know what he did uh, as he received that diploma, that he got that, uh, that uh, Marine cap uh, as he walked across the stage and he was immediately uh, involved in, uh, in World War II. And of course, uh, uh, one of the interesting stories that he tells about in several of his works has to do with uh, a, a young a wounded soldier who was next to him and, uh, and how that's, that soldier uh, listened to John talk and he said, it's uh, so good to have a southern voice nearby. It makes me feel good, at, at which point the young soldier died. And uh, that, that scene is a, a poignant one that he's uh, used in a number of ways. Uh, John was wounded, uh, he lost an eye. Um, so he was uh, blind in one eye. And uh, that uh, got him out of the service. Uh, I think he was, uh, he was in for maybe 13 days, so something like that. But he, he was in the reserves. Uh, he was a, a captain uh, for many years. Uh, after that. Uh, he then uh, got an MA from Columbia University. Uh, interestingly enough, he wrote a master's thesis on William Faulkner. Um, and uh, Faulkner, the two poles of the, the influences uh, on his work are William Faulkner and Ernest Hemingway. You know, so Hemingway writes sentences of four words and Faulkner writes them of uh, 400 words. Uh, but uh, the polls sort of got him into the different, uh, the different areas of literature. 
after he graduated from Columbia, he taught for a couple of years at UT, uh, decided that he didn't really want to spend his life being a professor and uh, eventually was able to, to focus on, on his writing. In 1958, he married Jane Marshall Cole, who was a buyer for Neiman Marcus. Neiman Marcus, yes. So, you know, this, this famous uh, rural figure, John Graves, known for taking care of, uh, of chickens and cattle and uh, living out in the country, married this woman who seems as though she would have been from a completely different realm, but they, uh, they had a long and, uh, and happy marriage. Their two children were Helen and Sally. He taught at uh, TCU from 58 to 65, off and on, adjunct professor of English. And it, it surprises me that how many people I've run into over the years who took one of John's classes, you know, and, and I, I wonder how many people just decide that, you know, I think I can say that I was in John Graves' class. Whether I really was or not, it'll be a good conversation starter. It doesn't seem like he should have had as many students as I have <laughs> been introduced to. Uh, over the years. In 1960, he published what is his, uh, although he might argue if he were here and, and say that Hard Scrabble is uh, his favorite, but Goodbye to a River is the, the book that he's known by, uh, Goodbye to a River, a narrative. It won the Collins, the Carr Collins Award for the Texas Institute of Letters in 1961. John was a Guggenheim Fellow in 63. He worked for a while at the Department of Interior writing books about, or articles about rivers. And uh, worked on a, a book called The Nation's River. Um, worked on a book called The Water Hustlers. And then he bought this 400-acre uh, bit of property up near Glen Rose, and that became his place called, called Hard Scrabble. That he, that he built and worked on regularly and uh, became the source of that book, Hard Scrabble Observations on a, Pla on a Patch of Land. Uh, his, uh, his next major work, he worked on a lot of smaller things, small stories, many of which were published by Bill Whitliff. Thank you, Bill Whitliff, for uh, being the source of the Whitliff galleries here. Uh, and Bill Whitliff and John Graves were very fast friends. Some would say that John was the fatherly figure for, uh, for Bill, but um, Bill published a number of, of John's smaller things, the, the story called The Last Running. Um, his next major work in 1980 was from a limestone ledge, some essays and other ruminations ruminations, ruminations about country life in Texas. Many of those came from articles that he wrote for Texas Monthly. Uh, Bill Broyles uh, um, encouraged him to write this, this column about the being in the country. I mean, Texas Monthly had then and still has this kind of uh, urban um, aura to it. And so the, the idea was to get John in to write these, uh, these articles about, uh, about taking care of hogs uh, and point to a, a different kind of Texas than Texas Monthly tended to suggest. Uh, another smaller work that, that Bill published was Blue and Some Other Dogs. One of the connections between John Graves and, and Rick is a, an interest in dogs and uh, We'll find out something about uh, Rick's uh, um, works that he's written about dogs. Uh, John won the Lon Tinkle Distinguished Award in 1983 from the Texas Institute of Letters. And uh, I'll read a bit of a piece that John wrote uh, over and over again. And this is one of the great dis differences between Rick and John is that John uh, was very aware that his production was not what he would like, like it to be. That uh, how did he live so long and not produce as much as he thought he should have produced. So when he won this award for the body of work, uh, one, one of the things that he, was, uh, that he was concerned about was how 
how he might be received as someone who really didn't have nearly as many works as, uh, as others. So I, I guess maybe I'll go ahead and I'm dominating this a little bit, but I'll you know, we'll turn to the questions with Rick. When John received that award, he talked about how it was difficult for him to think about his production, that it, it, he thought that he just hadn't uh, written enough, hadn't produced enough. And so he received the award and then he gave this talk this part of the talk to sort of um, point out something about uh, production. The thing that keeps me convinced of my own amateurism when I worry about such things as production, and I will say that it's not too often these days, is the incredible, the overwhelming, the rather magnificent scrawniness of the body of work that I managed to stack up over the years, that nice oxymoron, the magnificent scrawniness of the work. One of the tales had to do with a very pious old nun. I haven't thought about it for maybe 45 years, and I don't vouch for the details of my rendition. But essentially, the action centered around the fact that this saintly person fasted so steadily and severely that she went to the toilet only four times a year <laughs> on specific holy days, and with this can be imagined considerable travail. On the occasions, the other nuns would all gather close around her and would chant and sing and pray while she bent herself to her work until it, at, uh, at last she cried in triumph, to thee, O Lord, I give it, whereupon the hosannas would break out. Well, that's approximately how I feel about the rate at which my own work has been accomplished thus far. It's something I have seemed to have been compelled to do, but there hasn't been very much of it and has emerged at longest intervals with great effort. <laughs> Thus, I am perhaps inclined to special appreciation of any hosannas that come my way, and on such occasions as this one, receiving this award, I may be capable of more profound gratitude than a more copious producer might feel. Anyhow, I do thank you again, both for the award and for listening to me, one I may be capable of more profound gratitude than a more copious producer might feel. Anyhow, I do thank you. So, uh, he consciously aware of his production, that there are these big, these big books, the main books that we think about are John Graves' major works, but there are all of these smaller things that he did over the years, all of which had the same sort of di distinction. So, um, John, as I said, uh, died at the end of July in 2013, and it's, uh, it, it seems like it was you know, last year or something, but uh, the time moveth on. So with, uh, with that introduction to John Graves, since that's uh, sort of the subject that we're talking about, I wanna ask uh, Rick a few things. I guess the first thing I'll ask you is, did you get away from Fort Worth, or are you a Fort Worth boy? Boy, uh, they, uh, I guess they're not going to get any easier after that. Uh, I was hoping for a softball. Um, I didn't get away from, you know, I, there's just no talent in being ungrateful or, or, or snarky or negative. It's just so easy to be uh, these days or any days. I, I did get away from Fort Worth. I, uh, when my folks moved to Odessa Midland uh, when I was six months old and then uh, when I was one down to Houston, you know, oil patch. And, uh, and I grew up in Houston, spent, you know, 18 years there, 17 years there. But I do take great pleasure in saying I was born in Fort Worth. And I guess that's just, that seems ungrateful. I mean, Houston's a, uh, made me a lot of who I became. And, uh, and it also made me want to get out as, as soon as I could. <laughs> and, and, and so I did. But uh, that sounds ungrateful. I mean, if you, you know, it's, it, it, home is bittersweet. You can, you, can be, you can love it and hate it both, or you can love it and be, uh, have it not be enough, which it, it wasn't. But uh, I, I would go back up to Fort Worth often. My uh, father's parents uh, lived up there all of their lives. And so, you know, I'd go hang out with them uh, in summers and, and holidays. And, and uh, uh, it, it's very much home to me, uh, as is Houston. I mean, most of the biographies I see say you, you were born in Fort Worth, and they say grew up in Houston, and I never was sure exactly how, how quickly you got down there. For yeah, real quickly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kicking and screaming and, uh, 
and crapping all the way. <laughs> uh, I have a question that sort of that deals with your most recent book, the um, the Traveling Feast. Is that the, that the title? Um, and and you can tell them what the book is. But what, it's a book about Rick deciding to. Uh, visit a number of his writing friends, his writer friends over, over I'm not sure how long of a period it was, and that he would go and make them a meal, a meal that he de decided just for them. And so my question was, and, and, you, and you acknowledge in the, in the introduction to the book that you weren't able to do John Graves, that he died about the time you started the, this, uh, this task, task, this uh, uh, wonderful task. And, uh, and I wondered, if you had been able to do it for John, what would you have done? I mean, these meals were sort of carefully selected for these particular people. And I just wondered if you ever thought about what you would have done if, you, if he had been included in that. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and this, this, can you all hear, hear us in the back OK? Great, thank you. Uh, this project, uh, you know, I got to the middle of my life and, and had written a lot and was getting kind of tired of writing and wanted to go back to the well, you know, to my mentors who first gave me the, uh, the support and encouragement and, and uh, motivation to write. And tell, I wanted to tell them thank you for helping me when I was a younger writer. And oh, by the way, do you have any advice for me as a, a middle-aged writer? Because now they're really old. And uh, you know, as writers, we write, you know, really pretty obituaries when somebody passes on. And I wanted, I didn't want to have that awful feeling of having written a nice obituary that the writer who meant so much to you couldn't read. So uh, even though I never said it directly, I was going there to tell them thank you before they died. And, you know, but I just didn't tell them that part about dying. I just said thank you. And made a really nice meal for them. Uh, I had started cooking and it was really good in, in, in my own kitchen. And, and so I thought, oh, this, I've been able to make food taste great. I want to share this with them. And uh, I found out really quickly that Cooking in someone else's kitchen is, is just it's just night and day, you know? And uh, so we had a lot of misadventures trying to say thank you. Uh, a lot of stuff caught on fire. It got real black real quick, <laughs> quickly. It was not the intent. But, uh, you know, John dying in 2013 really was, uh, 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 he was such a mentor, remains so. Uh, it's so great to be here in, in the collection. Uh, thank you, Katie and Stephanie and Bill Whitler for dreaming it all, Liza putting it together. and. Um, you know, Mark, of course, is the gold standard of research on, on John, and it's all right here. And, and uh, going down in those folders is, is, is intense. You're going into the past, and it's, it's harrowing to go to time travel. It's harrowing uh, in a good way. But uh, uh, what I would have cooked for John if I had been able to, I uh, started the project in late 2013 cooking for, for Doug Peacock. Um, would have been steak and potatoes. That's what Jane cooked any time we would visit, and just, just a steak about almost the size of this table and, and, uh, and a potato the size of a football, and that's, that's all I remember. I don't think they messed around with greens. Uh, so I would have tried to, to emulate Jane's Sunday lunch. I'm not talking about dinner. This is what they ate at lunch. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, who were the uh, the ones that you cooked for that died later? M Matheson was one. I, I... Yeah, cooked cooked for Peter when he was really sick. Uh, uh, I said, "What would you like?" And and he he was did not have long and, and and knew it. And he said, "Well, I don't have much appetite, but a soup will be good." And so I got a really sweet, mellow, uh, uh, fresh parsnip and and morel cream. Uh, uh, soup and, and uh, I was telling him about it. I was reading him the recipe before I got out there and I uh, said, you know, that, that sounds good. I, I wouldn't mind a little salad and, and maybe some bread and, and, a, and a little light dessert and he just kept high. So that, that was really gratifying. Um, and then surprisingly, Dennis Johnson, you know, one of my younger mentors, uh, uh, died of, of liver cancer just shortly after, uh, after uh, actually we had two meals with Dennis. I went over to him in Idaho and cooked for him and his wife. Uh, Cindy and uh, and then they liked it and came over to my home in the Yak the next year and, and we cooked again and uh, and then bang he was gone uh, really quickly uh, and of course Jim Harrison died during the project uh, a great mentor and, and supporter uh, everybody was really generous all of the the folks let me 
come into their homes. You know, when you get old and you're, you're you know, you're looking down the barrel, you want to, your time becomes uh, precious. And for them to give that time up to me and also I brought my best students, my best fiction and nonfiction students with me to introduce the generation before me to the generation after me. And, and they were all so generous, far more generous than I, I would have been. I will, uh, you know, I already am. I, I wouldn't have people in my house. I'd work. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to ask Rick a series of questions about different ideas he's, as he uh, continues to work on this uh, biography of John, and he's going to deal with the ideas that were very much involved with John's work. And I'm just going to ask him about you know, how, what he knows of John's ideas about something like nature. That'll be the first topic that I'll ask him about. How does his uh, approach, how does Rick's approach to writing about the natural world compare and contrast to the way that, to, that John approached uh, writing about it? So, first topic. Can we go back to talking about Houston? Uh, uh, um, yeah, again, it's it's a huge pressure and 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 honor to be uh, task isn't the right word, but to be given the opportunity to write about John. I don't. I know the word is biography is what's what's being asked, but I, I I'm already trying to think of it as something in between a biography and an appreciation, a hybrid, and yet I do want to communicate, you know, the the importance of of, of his work to to Texas and to. To, uh, to the country um, and beyond. One of the great joys about being a fan of John's work is when you ask people, you don't ever ask them, you just assume that they don't know of his work. And then so, but it's this really extreme response. Either they don't know of him and then you have the great, that great thrill, that singular thrill of being able to give somebody a classic and say, this is going to change your life, this is going to blow you away. But that, that's just such a great thrill to a teacher or a, you know, a, a, a reader. Uh, but then also at the other end of the spectrum is that great immediate you know, bond with a reader who do, has read John's work already and knows, you know, knows, already knows the words to him number 134. And you, you're, <laughs> you're preaching to the choir. And, and, and so. Um, I'm bearing kind of both of those audiences in mind. And, and any of y'all out there who have direction or, or reminiscences or ideas about John's work, please, please contact me because it is very much uh, a work in progress, to say the least. Um, I, I'm just now dipping my toes in the water and starting to think about what, it, what the tone of it might be. It, it's, it's really overwhelming. I don't want it to be dry and, and, and uh, I want it to be as I don't know, I want to do my best job, but I don't even know what that looks like yet. So um, this nature question that, that Mark's asked, uh, John and I were, were really good friends, and this, this was the only place where we, we both had long, uh, un, not uncomfortable silences, but uh, just long enforced silences, uh, uh, because I'm such a uh, frenetic activist, and, and John, you know, was such a committed craftsman, you know, a, a, a contemporary Shakespeare. I mean, he was, he lived and breathed nouns and verbs and, and uh, the life of the mind. And, and, and then when he got done with the life of the mind, he'd go out and pick up rocks and shovel dirt and, 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 and fork hay and, and, uh, and not think about anything. But, but that, that middle ground between art and labor, uh, you know, I have filled with, with what Thomas Merton called the frenzy of the activist, which is a kind of violence. And, and uh, John, I think, had had enough violence in his life and wanted no more. And, and uh, uh, you know, we both, I think, shared uh, a very similar love for Texas landscape and, and for wildness. Uh, but I just was coming at it from a different place than John was. I was beginning my war, and he had finished his. So. So that's, uh, yeah, it was, I wouldn't call it a point of friction, but it was, uh, it was a, a, a difference of which I'm very mindful as I proceed into this biography. I, the worst thing you could do to, to your mentor would be to put words in his mouth that he would not want said. 
And so I, I think I know what he would not want said, and I think I know what I want to say. And I just want to be really fair in my, you know, soliloquy about what's me, not him, and what's him, not me, if that makes sense. And I had wondered about how you would get along on that question about a persuasive, writing persuasively, uh, an activist, because Rick has been and is now an activist always. And uh, John was very clear about a kind of subtle persuasion. He wrote an article when he was uh, teaching at TCU called On the Desirable Reluctance of Trumpets. And I gotta think about that one a minute. On the Desirable Reluctance of Trumpets. And trumpeting for him was the kind of active persuasion that many people would tell him, you know, you got to get at it, man. You know, you're, you're, you're not uh, fulfilling your role here. And his point was that, uh, that he thought that, uh, that subtlety was a stronger way to persuade than, um, than to be the kind of uh, uh, horn tooter, tootling the horn. That's the trumpet part of that title, that to uh, being uh, subtle uh, not engaging f uh, fully and immediately was this, the, what he was to, what he was arguing about uh, in in that piece, and interestingly enough, um, I think that Goodbye to a River is a hugely persuasive book without without much trumpeting. Uh, that it's uh, that reading that book at the end of the t at the end of reading it you know that this is a place that must be preserved. And John never gets up and says, we have to do this. Uh, I compared it to uh, Mark Anthony's uh, praising of Caesar. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. Or, uh, and then he, then he praises and persuades the audience fully. Uh, and this is what John does in a kind of a reluctant trumpeting in, uh, in his approach to writing about the, the natural world. Do you, do you buy that? Uh, uh, <clears throat> yeah, com completely. It, it's a complicated uh, issue, but it won't surprise those who, who know his work to, to realize he was you know, ahead of the game, ahead of the curve. Uh, uh, what activists deal with so much now is, is donor fatigue. You know, we are so besieged and benumbed by the call to arms. You know, everything is burning, everything is is poisoned, everything is, you know, it's, it's a, excuse my language, a shit sandwich, and, and uh, nobody wants to hear that story. I mean, that's when, when beauty really matters. The, the great painter, landscape painter, Russell Chatham, I'm paraphrasing him, he, you know, he said, when, when the, <clears throat> the world is a, a void, you need to fill it with your soul, and, and uh, you know, John, that's what John did with his descriptions of nature. He, he didn't waste time or, or uh, risk uh, alienating the reader by asking something of them or trumpeting. He, he gave them, you know, these beautiful descriptions and, and looks at his interior and, and gifts, and uh, it was very effective, yeah. What about hunting? How does your attitude toward hunting compare to John's attitude toward hunting? I think I had uh, maybe a prolonged uh, adolescence that, that John didn't with regard to hunting. Uh, I hunted a long time uh, before I started to lose my, my bloodlust. Uh, I think, again, you know, this is not rocket science. You know, John, reading his work, he was pretty, pretty keen about, you know, hunting and gathering as a young man and, uh, uh, you know, eating what he gathered, but, but not necessarily discriminate about what he ate. And, and uh, then came back and was, was different and, and not so... Uh, not so fond of firearms, uh, and uh, you know it's taken me a, a lot longer to get there. But I understand where uh, you know we're, I think we're all hunters end, end up. It's like it's it's not as much fun as it used to be. Uh, still like to eat the meat, but uh, you know, yeah, just just <laughs> it changes. Yeah. Uh, John tells a story in Goodbye to a River about how he got to this point that he decided he would hunt no more, that he was giving up hunting, and then. I think it's a duck that's flying by, and it's a great shot, and he immediately grabs his gun. Now, I don't know whether he got the duck or not, but th th this is that kind of, amb you know, ambivalence. Uh, and it, um, to some extent, it's 
it's, it's presented in the Goodbye to a River in a kind of uh, Henry David Thoreau versus Ernest Hemingway. That uh, you remember what he, how he designates the two it was of them. Prince and Lord, who was it? Which was which? Uh, Saint, uh, Saint Henry. Saint Henry Thoreau and and Prince Ernest Hemingway, uh, and uh, you know, John leaned to the side of uh, of Hemingway. He, and Lord. He, as he thought that uh, that Thoreau was too pure and uh, not maybe not human. Um, uh, which is, it sort of leads to another topic, and uh, that topic of violence. I, I don't. Uh, uh, how much uh, violence do you have you written about? Do you spend? Uh, have you uh, spent a lot of time? I'm trying to remember scenes. Uh, what do you think? Well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. I've not ever ever been asked that. I uh, I do a lot of teaching, and uh, uh, there's just some things that don't work out on the page, and violence is one of them. Uh, it's, I can only think of one scene, uh, and this includes Hemingway and, and Faulkner and the whole, the whole crew. The only, uh, I think, literary treatment of violence that I can recall seeing was McCarthy when, when the boys are in prison and, and he's got the knife under the tray. Mm. Um, Everything else is, is uh, uh, I think, a flaw in logic. Uh, uh, I mean, I know there's violence you know, in the world, and you have to represent the world, but uh, an emotional violence stays coiled and, and taut. As soon as you put physical violence on the page, it's going to release the tension that you've been trying to build and create. So you're working against yourself. It's, it, it just doesn't, you know, uh, I've never seen it done well. I don't. I don't I try and work uh, with emotional violence rather than physical violence because physical violence is just boring. You know, it's just, it's, you, you start writing about somebody hitting somebody or somebody shooting somebody, it's like you don't feel it uh, the way you do if you were to feel them not shooting or not striking someone. Uh, hold the tensions. If you're trying, tension, violence is tense. And so when you complete the physical act of violence, then you lose the tension when you're trying. It, it's, that's just not logical. John tended to, de to deal with violence, historical violence. The Indian depredations or the hanging of old of Cooney Mitchell, as I recall. That, yeah, uh, second hand, uh, third hand, distant. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that allowed him to distance yeah. rather than him being in the, as a, if he were writing about it as a fiction writer, that he'd be in the middle of the, but putting it in the historical context, and, and there's a kind of a distance that. Uh, that's derived there. And then he would twist it to have uh, part of the power of the scene being the way that he was relating it, you know, with, with his arch humorous language about, you know, something really awful happening to somebody. And that distance was somehow the safety and, and then of distance and then the humor uh, taking another turn away from violence so that it's awful, but it's like doubly removed. Or irony. I mean, there's yeah, yeah, one, the one, the one story that he tells is about, um, I, I've forgotten the details of the story, but he tells a story about a violent act, and he takes the side of the person <coughs> who received the violence, as I recall. And then he published that story, and a few years later, he gets a letter from a hundred-year-old woman, I, is, uh, or, or pushing a hundred, and she, and she tells him that he was completely wrong. That, uh, that the way that he decided to present the story was not the way that it happened at all. And, uh, and John ends that discussion by saying um, something to the effect that is writing a worthwhile occupation, question mark, questioning himself about the way that he had written this. I, I, I don't have the, the details exactly right, but that's uh, essentially the use of irony to, to turn back on an idea, and I think he does that in a number of ways. Um, writing fiction versus writing nonfiction. I mean, you've, you started out ma mainly, I guess, a nonfiction writer, but you've really done a lot of fiction now. And you know, John was not successful, it doesn't seem like, with his fiction. That speckled horse that uh, is in the John Graves reader, that it seems like that, uh, that, that, that once he got negative re responses to it, uh, he didn't really deal much in fiction anymore. 
the, how do you make this, bridge this gap between fiction and nonfiction? And did you ever talk to him about it? I did, I did not ever talk to, to John about, about bridging the, the gap. Uh, he, he uh, yeah, he didn't talk about his fiction. Um, he he was, was supportive of mine and, and, and uh, uh, but we didn't talk about his fiction. Um, uh, uh, so how did you cross over to? Oh, well, how I, I was thinking about him. Yeah. How I crossed over. Um, well, that, I guess I am kind of thinking about that. I'm trying to put, put myself in his context. What would it have been like to be, you know, this incredible writer of sentences, writer of incredible sentences in, in the 50s and 60s? I mean, you've got Hemingway and Faulkner and what, Eudora Welty and, and uh, I mean, just this, this, you know, this pantheon of great Nobel Prize winning fiction writers uh, in, in America and, uh, and in, ex, it, Intense stylist, as Mark said, like Hemingway and, and Faulkner, and, and uh, reading John's fiction in the archives. I mean, it's Faulknerian, uh, and and um, something else that I always knew about John was how incredibly intelligent he is. Uh, and what I'm starting to think about, and this was a conversation I'd like to have with him, uh, and didn't. It is to Mark's question. Uh, I think John was so smart that it might have been a, a, an impediment or challenge, a headwind to writing fiction. Uh, you can see in his archives where he starts out on a scene and then has the, uh, like a great bird dog, has the physical and mental capacity to go way left and right to cast and, and, and yet keep multi he's got all these characters in his, in his, his, his outlines and stuff, and, and uh, it just seems like an extraordinary amount of information to hold in one's head, and John was really good at that. And I think as a fiction writer, when you don't have a lot of information in your head, you have to lean on the imagination, and then that's what makes a story get up and move and resonate and be mysterious, and you following that which you don't know. I don't think John was too keen about following stuff that he didn't know. I think he was keen about learning and knowing stuff and, and really good at it. Uh, so I think that might have worked against him. Uh, hmm. In a way, it doesn't work against me. But. Well, I'm going to ask a question about dogs. Um, but uh, my wife Linda and I have a golden retriever named Hud. And when I tell people of a certain age that I have a dog named Hud, you know, uh, older people, of course, will, oh yeah, that uh, great Paul Newman movie. You know, younger people will say, you named your dog for housing and urban development? <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, in, in Goodbye to a River, the, the dog named Passenger, and I'm, I'm not sure why he decided to use a different name for, I mean, the dog was, was uh, named Cocovate, a peanut, and I think they called him Wadi, but he, but he calls him Passenger in Goodbye to a River, and, and I don't quite know why he, d why he did that. But uh, you've written about dogs, uh, and d were you influenced to, in your writing about dogs by reading John's interest at all, or did you ever think about the comparison between your work and his? Uh? I, I don't know if I was, if I, you know, consciously if I was or not, but, uh, but I loved, uh, Blue and, and, and loved Waddy's, you know, the passenger in, in, in Goodbye to a River. I think it was just, uh, you know, comfortable to me. That's what you grow up reading is, you know, it's okay to write about your dog. And, and uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think it was conscious, but uh, yeah, they're pretty interesting, interesting folks. You know, John would often have a distance between subject matter, but, but dogs, those of you who haven't read his uh, story about Blue, I mean, this, this is a tearjerker and a, a, a fully emotional story that uh, it, it strikes me as being a little bit different in style and tone than uh, John often, often wrote. Uh, but uh, he obviously was a dog, a dog person as well. So you've written Col Culture, is, where did the name come from for that dog? Uh, that was the name he was born with. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I, uh, a, a guy up in the valley was a falconer and, uh, uh, and raised German short hairs. And, and uh, I had not, 
not had a bird dog before, and uh, I knew Tom well, Tom and Nancy, and they had this litter, and, and they said, why don't you come by and look at them? And, and uh, that, you know, that was code for a come by one, and I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but I sure didn't leave there without one. And, and then, uh, uh, yeah, that was, he, Coulter was named for uh, the mountain man in, in Yellowstone country who uh, uh, outran his captors and, and uh, escaped, you know, after a long, arduous, barefoot, naked journey through, uh, through Yellowstone country. His namesake could cover some country also, whether I was whistling for him to come back or not. Yeah, but he was a great dog. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to give the audience a chance to ask uh, any questions that you might have. We have a, f a few more minutes. I have a Q&A mic here. Thanks. Um, I got to meet uh, John Graves be when he came to the Whitliffe Collection several times. and. I actually hadn't heard of John Graves before I moved here, which was 30 years ago. Um, but of course, the minute I met him, I read Goodbye to a River. So here's my little confession. I have not read you, even though I know your name. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to know, um, in some of your writing, where I can find an example of what you referred to as frenetic activism. Oh, uh, <laughs> throw, a, throw a dart. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, could you all hear the question? Um, uh, there is frenetic activism in a book called The Book of the Yak. Uh, I'm a board member of the Yak Valley Forest Council. The Yak is the valley where I live in Montana. It's Y-A-A-K. And you could go to our website, uh, www.yakvalley.org, and, and uh, there's a lot of freneticism on that. Uh, thank you for asking. It's, it's a magical, special place, and uh, uh, we're fighting it was a very small group of us very, fighting very hard for protecting the public land up there. It's a 97, 98% national forest. It's owned by all of us. An incredible place. Yeah. You're not living there all the time now? Uh, it's my home. I'm, I'm on an airplane too much. Uh, uh, yeah. It's, it's a four hour drive for you to get to an airport? Yeah. Four and a half in good weather, yeah. Um, too much airplane time. But. Other questions from the audience? Don't be shy now. Is it too early to ask if you have a projected publication date for the book? It's not too early to ask. It's definitely too early to answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there, there's, there's always, you know, in marketing, it's nice to have even numbered dates. You know, this is the 25th anniversary. This is the 50th anniversary. Uh, uh, but I think it's it's... You know, we would all also agree it's more important for to be really as good as you can make it. So that's more my concern. I'm working with expediency, but also uh, doing a lot of exploration. And so I, I'm, I, it was funny reading some of John's letters today uh, for the Skies book that he did with, with Wyman Meinzer. He was, uh, you know, the publication kept drifting one year after the next, and they'd be writing, "We think it's going to be next year. It's going to be next year. It's going to be next year." And, they got it right, a beautiful book. I had the great privilege of looking at some of Robert Hart's images that, that Robert took of John and John and Jane in 92 and I had not seen those before. And that, that's really, a, it's just still really coming together. Uh, so many organic, strange little things. Just uh, I was commenting to Robert in some of his photographs. Jane is standing there very elegant, elegantly with her scarf and she's got her hands crossed like this. and. And John is standing there next to her with his hands like this. And you know, total opposites. And, and yet the plane of their arms in this photograph is identical. It's, you know, thinking about those kinds of little subtleties and then building metaphors out of them. I, I don't think I can hit a deadline with it, I'm afraid. But uh, I'll sure try. But uh, I just want to see where it goes. It's, it's, I've never done a biography before, and it's, it's, uh, it's challenging. You don't think John will hold it against you that it's going to be a Texas A&M book? I mean, he was Rice, and uh, I don't think Rice and A&M ever uh, were great pals. I, I take every step wondering, will John hold this against me? <laughs> <laughs> Other questions? I was wondering about the time you came to Brenham. Uh, Rick did a story on semi-pro football, a team we have in Brenham, Texas. And not only did he stand on the sideline and interview the players and coaches, but he got in there and played. <laughs> and the guys are massive. 
you can feel the ground vibrate when they run off sides to the sideline. I, I just wonder, was that a scary situation, carrying the ball through that three hole? <laughs> that, that was a long time ago. That was, that was, a, that was last April. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's good to be terrified. I mean, like, it's so, we spend so much time not terrified that uh, I, I, it was lovely being terrified, but it was terrifying, yeah. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all work with athletic departments anywhere, but this incredible uh, team, the, the Texas Express and Brenham, they are kind of a, a ragtag uh, operation. A lot of students, uh, young people, not, some of them not so young, uh, you know, and sometimes on hard times, and this, the, the team helps give them focus and, and direction in their life, and uh, they're looking for gear and support all the time, but it's, uh, it's, a cool, it's a cool project. I really enjoyed getting to know it, and Kirby's the, the trainer for them, and uh, they have this very charismatic, uh, profane, religious coach, and uh, it's a great paradox is uh, the way he can curse and pray at the same time. <laughs> uh, you have to dodge the spit uh, when, he's, when he's lecturing. Uh, yeah, but they were big and fast and strong. God, it was, it was like being charged by a grizzly. I mean, it's like, you're really alive when it's happening. And then if you get, if you're not injured, it's just gravy. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? Are there any particular adventures that you're looking forward to? What a great question. Are there any particular adventures I'm looking forward to? Uh, Can you repeat the question? Yes, sir. she's asking, are there any uh, Adventures, particular adventures that I'm looking forward to. And, and uh, I think it's so important to look forward and not back. And that's why it's so intense going in these archives and looking way back, you know, decade by decade by decade. It, it freaks me out because that's not how I want to live. I want to be looking forward to what's next. I, I, I've not been to Mongolia and I have, have great, great desire to. Uh, um, um, other than that, yeah, sometimes I feel like I've pretty much done everything I want, so it's a really good question. Uh, yeah, Mongolia or bust, I guess. <laughs> I just have a quick question for you. Um, knowing you over the 30 years, I've seen your writing change, obviously. How are you going to separate your true friendship with John and your differences in your likeness um, to write an objective Biography. I was counting on you for an easy one. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't mean to give a smart aleck answer. I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, I think about it, you know, every day. Uh, some days I think, you know, don't try and sugarcoat it, don't try and do it. And then some days I think, okay, try it and see if you can do it. And, and uh, I'll probably settle somewhere in between. But uh, it's, it's a great question. It's one I think. Uh, you know, an, uh, an astute reader will be picking up on anyway in, in the first page, but I also don't want it. I don't like reading books where, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's a fawning and, and, and glorification and puffing up. Um, I think I just have to be honest with, with what he meant and means to me and, uh, and then try and find something interesting in that space between us. Uh, I, I, I think. I don't think I'm the person to write, you know, the uh, the uh, sterile biography that with that distance, and, and uh, I'll just do the best I can with that proximity, that closeness. I think it'll be great. Uh, that's, thank you. That's kind. Uh, oh. I've got a question for you. Yes, John. Here. Uh, do you have a which which one of your books is your favorite? Uh, uh, such a it's such a hard question. Which of my books is my favorite? Uh, I'm, I, you know, like it's raising uh, kids, and I hate it when writers say, oh, my books are like my children. Uh, no, a book's not a child. It's not like your children. It's like, that's, that's such a, it's just so dumb. Uh, has anybody in here ever said that? I, hope like, I, I pity you if you say your books are like children. But I see where that, that comment often comes from. Uh, you know, the ones that you struggle with the most sometimes have a, a, a special you know, bond to you. And, and I really struggled with my first novel, all, uh, Where the Sea Used to Be. And, and so I have, a, it has a special, I have a special attachment to it. I don't think it's my best, but I'm, it's the one I work the hardest with. Uh, 
Um, there was another book I was thinking the other day I was kind of happy with. I'm not, I'm pretty happy with this Traveling Feast book that, that Mark was talking about, my most recent, uh, uh, you know, it, it, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with it. But again, like to your Mongolia question, I, I, hopefully the, the book I like best is the one I'm working on now, yeah. <laughs> As you're doing your research on John Graves, what's the most surprising thing you've found out about him that you didn't know before? I'm not sure. You know, it's, it's, it's a splendid question. I think, yeah, I think it's probably already there in my notes, but I'm just, it's such a descent. I mean, I'm sinking down through strata and strata and strata, and it's all, because it's all so different, n none of it stands out as more remarkable than the other. It's all, it's all new to me. It's all strange. And I mean, again, the, the yellow scarf he was wearing in the photograph that, that Robert took, um, uh, there's something on every page. Uh, uh, he used the word DDT in the 1950s. It's like, uh, you know, he started, and it's just like, oh, that's an ugly word. And, and like, and I could, I could just, I don't know, it's all surprising. Uh, that's not much of an answer. I wish I had a really glib, quick answer. I can say the, probably the most surprising thing to me was when I read his memoir, his late memoir, Myself and Strangers, um, which I don't know how old he would have been when that was uh, finished. But he's very open about women that he had relationships with before he was married and living abroad. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I somehow, it felt like I was sort of peeking in the window on, his, on sort of his private life, but he was very open about it. He felt like he had to tell that this, this was an important part of his history and that, uh, that, that he thought it needed to be included. But I, Speaking of terrifying. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> like he said, he only wrote four books his whole life. Uh, he, he wrote more than four, teasing. I have one question for Rick, uh, as we're kind of getting close to the time. And that is this question, do you have any sort of uh, good luck symbols? Uh, you, is, is the statue of, of John Gra Graves out there right now? As you leave, you can go look at his belt buckle. That his belt buckle, a kind of an infinity symbol, is his good luck sign. And he uh, specifically tr uh, tried to get it included in some way in in many of his of his books. And if you if you look at the frontispiece for Goodbye to a River, you'll see that good luck uh, symbol. Uh, and it must have worked because that book certainly was a good luck book for him. So, do you have a good luck symbol of any sort? That, that I, I do. I had never thought of that, but um, I, I know. Uh, thank you for asking that question. It's kind of it's it's still coming so much together, but I do have one. It's uh, it's up in the valley. It's this butte, this hill, and I just love making these three lines. It's the shape of the uh, of, of Roderick Butte, and it just it's how it looks when you're you're down in the valley looking at it. You can just you know those those waves of one horizon mirroring the shape of the other one just a little farther on, and the one behind that that kind of that blue ridge. Uh, uh, imagery and, and uh, it's also kind of the stroke that when bears are clawing on aspen trees that their, their claw marks kind of leave that that sweep that scapular pull but yeah it, it just makes you feel good to doodle it and and you see a lot of those doodlings in John's manuscript when you know he's daydreaming <laughs> <laughs> I have another question the first thing, the first gift my husband ever gave me was goodbye to a river. And it's only after 35 years with him that I really understand what it meant. But um, he did canoe when he was young. His dad taught at TCU and he canoed with John on the Brazos. And I don't know the whole story. I wish my husband was here today. He wanted to be here and he couldn't. But um, while you're digging through the archives, if you find anything about a trip with a TCU professor down the Brazos, I want to know about that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I will we have one more question back here at the back. Um, I recently started reading Goodbye for a River to a River and haven't finished it yet, but one thing that I stuck out to me that I enjoy is that he writes people, indigenous people, and the history into the landscape. I'm an archaeologist, so I study people in the landscape. And I'm just, I'm interested in 
whether that's a conscious thing you think for him and for you and your writing, Rick, um, because I feel like a lot of times people can kind of write history and humanity out of the landscape. So I'm just curious on your perspective on that. No, that's a great question. Uh, I have my own opinion. I, th I think Mark, uh, I'd love to know your, your thoughts on John and people and, and landscape. I, I think he, uh, that they were all intertwined, that uh, the, the people obviously influenced the landscape and the landscape hugely influenced the people. Uh, you know, he talked about the, the talk people uh, and his uh, term for people who, who grew up in kind of hard scrabble uh, country near where he built his place. And the, these interrelationships of people and, and place are, I think, the, the center of the way he looked at the world. And, and, it's, uh, and it's not just a, you know, a, a, a small place. I mean, he, uh, one of the things about Goodbye to a River is that there are all of these references to the larger world, that it's not just this small place, it's the small place and the way that the smaller place r relates to the rest of the world. And he uh, would do that by the, a, a long list of uh, writers from other countries and other places and other times that, uh, that the small place, the way that the individual recognized home was also important to making the connections to not home. And so uh, place uh, uh, is always uh, a, a part of the way that he would talk about people. Thank you, thank you. That's well, I guess we've uh, sort of come to the end of our time. I'd like to thank Rick for being with us. And thank all of you for coming out.